Yo people, it's Joey here from Benchview TV and I'm here to interview my good friend Mandela Egbo, former England Youth International and current Charlton footballer. Yes guys, so I'm here with Mandela Egbo. Talk to me my bro, how are things? I'm steady bro, steady, can't yeah. complain, can't complain. Well, it's good to see you as always though, but what are you saying, ready to talk some bull or what? It's up to you bro, I know as a Spurs fan it can be difficult. Oh, you want to talk bull? We can talk bull still, it's not, it's not as bad as it looks, I can't lie man. Is that, is that what you think? I mean, what's your compa compared what's to it? Arsenal, but you know. What's your predictions for the season then for you lot? I'll tell you what, I'm hoping for cheeky little FA Cup and a top four. In the current circumstances, I can't complain still. What, what are you saying for Arsenal? You reckon you're not going to really win this title or what? I reckon, depending on the next few games, I don't know when this is coming out, but I reckon if we, if we deal with United, I think I'll start having hope still. Mm. I'm trying to keep it level-headed at the minute because I've seen Arsenal put me through a lot of pain, but right now we're looking good. Can't what? complain. you still got City home and away. What you we got City home and away. If we take four points from them two games, I'll be happy. Even just the three points from them two games, I'll be happy still. Mm. So, so it's a young end to the season, but... We'll see how it goes, bro. We will, bro. We will. But let's get straight into it, anyway. We're in your, we're in your, your, your manor. Yeah. Hackney, Hackney boy, born and bred. Born and not born actually. I was actually born in um like Kilburn's, like Neasden sides. Mm -hmm. But moved when I was one. Parents moved when I was one. So this is this is where I'm from. This, right? is, this is what you know. Isn't this it? is what yeah. I know. Yeah. Okay. So talk to me about growing up in Hackney. Then what was your first or your early ways of getting into ball and that? Um. Well, I mean, literally, this is where I was raised. Literally grew up here. Mm. It's my family's house or flat for the first um, maybe four or five years of my life. Yeah. Um, the Volvo, then obviously we moved a bit down the road. <laughs> I won't say in what direction because... <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Because it can get techie. But um, nah, this is where I was raised. I remember just coming, kicking ball at the park down the road. Mm. It's like my earliest memories are just kicking ball at the park. Yeah. Um, my dad taking me down the park on my little tricycle. Mm. It being the hood, yeah. that tricycle didn't last long. You had to keep your eyes on it. One day, one day we took our eyes off it. Yeah, and it never goes came already, back. Yeah. Never come back. But yeah, man, this is um, this brings back memories, man. I ain't been here for a while, mm. but this brings back memories, good times. It's good, man. It's good. Like, I love like you know, coming from the manor and that. You're exposed to like different things, isn't it? So different ways of playing, like street ball. Mm. You're probably was out here playing on the street and that, like. So I play on the street, you know, kicking the balls against the walls. Kirby, or they have different little ball games. All of them that. little things, but it was mainly, you know, just me and my dad, innit? Mm. Obviously, I didn't know many of the youths growing up around here specifically. It was me, just me and my dad kicking ball. Mm. And my younger siblings was obviously both girls, so they wasn't interested in the ball. But um, obviously, then as I got older, there's crying a manner. That's more like street. Mm. That's where man really, you know, learned the hood side of. That's how we met as well. So. Yeah, of course, of yeah. course. Crown of Manor back in the day. Then there was Hackney JFC, which was like more of like a co-over coaching or however you pronounce it, co-over mm. coaching type of thing. More mm. skills. And then we got on the pitch, the eight aside pitches and play there. And Market um, road days. Yeah. Market road days. Market road, bro. Market road days, man. What a time. Yes, trust me. So going from from there, so would you say like early doors you knew like playing for Crown of Manor and obviously Hackney JFC, like would you say you knew from then that you wanted to go into playing professional football or was it just a hobby at that time? It was just a hobby bro, it was a hobby for a long long time man. Um, I didn't know what it meant to be a professional footballer, obviously I watched Arsenal growing up a lot and I watched mm. a lot of the Prem and I supported them but I didn't really know until a lot later down the line which I'm sure we'll get to that it was actually like a career that man can, you know, mm. actually make a living off. Make a living off that mm. thing. It sounds weird to say that, but I remember never thinking about contracts or anything like that for a long, a lot longer down the line. Just pure love of the game. At the pure time, love of the game, bro. Mm. And in a way, there is still that pure love of the game. It's good. It's a good way to keep it because you know, once you make it professional, people start to look at it differently and just look at it just a job instead of remembering why they started playing football at the same time. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I think that's a good thing to hear from me to obviously hear that you still look at it as I play for the love of the game as well as making a living. So It's difficult though, man, because you see the game do people wrong mm. and there's ups and downs in it. But of course. if you can kind of, what I try to do, I try to separate business from from the love of it itself. And if you can try to get a balance of it, then I mean, I'm, no, I'm not perfect, but hopefully that can stand you in good stead. Okay, so 
moving on from that little segment there, talk mm. to me about obviously leaving Hackney and Crown and Manor and moving into Palace. Like, how did that happen? How did that come about? Um, obviously, when I was when I was playing for Hackney JFC, should we, start, should we keep walking? Yeah, you can keep walking. When I was pl- playing for Hackney JFC, that's when I first got scouted. And um, initially, I got scouted for Chelsea. Oh. And Didn't I went on a trial, that. yeah, I went on a trial at Chelsea when I must have been about 10. Done a six week trial, wasn't um, wasn't successful trial in the end, but you know, they had good words about me. They said I was a bit small at the time and that I should just come back the year, but the next year, but obviously, maybe they just say that to everybody. Mm, yeah, so yeah. Unsuccessful trial. Um, and then it must have been less than six months later. It would have been a little while later, maybe a year later, I started playing up in Brixton. Okay. But yeah, so a lot of my yeah. footballing was actually from Hackney. I moved into Brixton, so a lot of it was South London. Brixton, we were training in Streatham, we were training in Peckham. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my early footballing life was also South London. Mm-hmm. That's where a lot of my friends are from South London these days. Mm-hmm. I was playing for a team called Afui Urban. Okay. Based Brixton Rec. Obviously, this is post Market Road, post Haggerston Park times. Um, I was playing for them for a while and then um, ended up getting scouted by Palace. <coughs> obviously mm-hmm. South London um, catchment area, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, of course. So then obviously we've gone to Palace now on a trial. Six weeks ended up being a few months. But after a couple of months at the end of, or the beginning of the under 12 season, yeah, that's when they, um, they signed me at Palace. So I've been at Palace since I was 11 years old, under 12s and um, yeah, that's how you went from Hackney to, to South London. Crazy, crazy. So going through Palace then, what was it like playing for Palace? Like Academy football, how did you find it? Yeah, Palace was um, Palace was always fun, man. Palace was fun from the day I started to the day I left. Like, mm. Obviously, as an under 12, as an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old kid, you're just playing. There's mm. no other worries. Um, I remember we had some good coaches at the time. One guy called Antonio, some Italian guy, mm-hmm. was our coach at the time. And he, um, he was very much, I'm gonna make every single one of you better. So I remember at the end of the under 12 season, his first full season, it was like, who's getting new contracts, where to tear, who might not be left. And one by one, we all came up and he was shaking people's hands, shaking people's hands, shaking people's hands. And he shook every single man's hand and gave them all a contract. And right. so I'm not in the, I'm not in the business of releasing 13 year old kids if you don't get a new contract that's my fault yeah so he's wow. on he was in the business of he kept us all on made us all better players and um yeah he 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 played a big part in my growing up as well antonio falanga shout out to him man yeah man definitely definitely okay so, so that's um yeah that's the under 12 season the under 13 season was a bit different in that we had some new coaches John Solarco came in. Hmm. I know John Solarco. Palace legend. Yeah, Palace legend, yeah. Um, he must have been doing his badges or whatever. I'm not sure at the time, but he came in on the 13s and um, he wasn't having me one bit. He wasn't having me one bit and um, he wanted to release me actually. So this is like my first time going through. Yeah, a bit of trials and tribulations. Tri- 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 mm. as, far, as far as Palace is concerned, because obviously at Chelsea there was not getting the deal in the first place. Yeah. But at Palace, that is the first time. He didn't like me. He wanted to. He would have released me, but the um, academy manager at the time said, "Listen, I see something in you." He said it to my dad, obviously. I see something in you, and he gave me the opportunity to either train with the current under 12, so train down mm-hmm. for the rest of the season, oh, train and play yeah. down for the rest of the season, mm-hmm. or leave and look for somewhere else where I was gonna play. Wow. So my oh. dad asked me, "What do you want to do?" And then we sat down and um. Palace was what I knew at the time and Palace, apart from that particular coach or season, was treating me well. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's where my friends were. Yeah. And obviously going from Afui in South London to Palace, there was a lot of people from the from the area that I knew and had grown to become friends with. with. Of course. So Some relationships like, with them. Exactly. Sure. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I think at this time, you know, there's also the thing of new schools, this and the other. The last thing we really needed was a whole new change of scenery again. Of course, of course. So I decided to stay at Palace. <coughs> I trained down played down and met a coach at the time called Jamie Waller mm-hmm. who to this day we'll get into that later but to this day is still a very good friend of mine and um trained with him for a while ended up finding form scored god knows how many goals in god knows how many games because I was a striker mm-hmm. right winger at the time mm-hmm. 
and um, yeah, just did that to the end of that season. And then, yeah, had a good year, or ended up having a good year. Then we're into the under 14 season. New coaches again. Um, and that's where I converted to a right back. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So, at what point did you convert to a full back? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the under 14 season, actually. Um, Dan, Dan Carroll, I don't know how I remember all these guys' names, to be fair. Dan Carroll, um, he decided that he saw something in me as a right back. Mm-hmm. Which I'm, probably means that he didn't see enough of me as a right winger. He just right goes in, he just <laughs> Normally back. just get moved down. Yeah, get moved down. But yeah, um, I went to right back and it was, it was a great decision, I guess, because I've been there ever since and it gave me the opportunity to really kick on in my career. And oh. to be honest, I wouldn't want to be a right winger coming up against, you know, the type of quality that plays that position these days. Yeah, so I much rather be, you're growing up now. Yeah, exactly, bro. I'd much rather be a good attacking fullback, fullback than <laughs> average right winger. Era of the fullbacks as they call it nowadays. Literally, isn't it? bro, literally. So um yeah, that's 30, 12s, 13s, 14s. 15s is where things started to get a bit more serious for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 15s is where um you know, there was a Nike. I remember there was a, this is when Ben Garner was my manager. Mm-hmm. The, for the for the first time properly, he'd taken me at under 12s in a tournament in Italy or Switzerland or something like that. So I knew of him. He knew me since I was 11. But then under 15s was the first time he was my manager. And um, obviously we know where that took us in the end. Of course, we'll get to that bit. Yeah, so um, that's my first time coming into contact with Ben Garner and he's a great coach. He... Um, he helped me just, you know, nail down things at that position of right back. Fairly still a new position to me. And, um, yeah, we went to Nike Cup. That's where you start to see, you know, these Liverpool ballers. They're all my age, but yeah. you kind of, you still, you knew who they were. These names, mm. like Shea Ojo at the time and people like that. Um, we went there and then there's talk of our oh, England. I didn't know mm. that, you know, you played for England as a youth. Into, like, I didn't know that stuff. Until now, there's England scouts That's maybe watching, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to be scouted, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. And you don't mm-hmm. even realise that you're... I'm guessing clubs have two or three players in each age group that they're kind of... Pushing. Pushing, or mm-hmm. that they see a future. But at the time, I didn't know that I was one of them. Yeah. And I didn't know that might be. We didn't know none of that. I was just playing. Mm-hmm. So you get to under 15s as this Nike Cup. All of a sudden, it's like sponsorships who's getting given boots yeah. do you get it yeah, and i was yeah. never really that guy that was given boots until then i remember my dad used to just have me in black boots <laughs> black boot policy yeah. like straight all these men were wearing mercurials i was wearing black tempos thinking when can i when can i get a little bit of flair into my life yeah um it was very 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 that's how i was raised man i was raised very you know my dad you know, yeah, know the type of man he was R.I.P. Uncle Freddy as well. R.I.P. Papa, man. Trust me. Um, yeah, so it was very traditional in the way we done things. Yeah. I think that's the that's the reason I have the work ethic that I have. But yeah, um, Nike Academy, England Scouts. And then, um, yeah, getting into under-16s is obviously the first time you start to play for England and that. Mm-hmm. And I realised I'd been scouted for England. So talk to me about that then. What was that feeling like when you first got the call-up? Oh, it was it was it was sick because it was a bit of a surprise. I remember, like I said, you hear about these scouts, but there was another player, left back Jacob, who we all thought I think was gonna be um the one, the one. Mm. Like I could, I would, like, he could dribble, he could he scored goals. Like Jacob was that player. Um. So yeah, Jacob Jacob was in the I think Jacob was in the first squad on um standby, mm-hmm. and I weren't involved in the first squad. This was Victory Shield games. Mm-hmm. And then the second one, I was on standby and then called into the squad late. And then the third one, obviously, I was in the squad for real. And we um, played Scotland and we won the Victory Shield. And I played, obviously, the full game. And that was my first England game. Sky Sports at the time was, yeah. like, a big thing. Yeah, of course. Like, first game on Sky. I think we played up at Burton Albion. Obviously, um, I can't remember if that's the first time up at St George's. It probably was. Mm. That was when St George's was just brand just new. Just brand new, yeah. Brand new, because I remember even the, the camps before that were at Warwick University, so it mm-hmm. wasn't even St George's yet. And yeah, that's Victory Show, man. That was the first experience with England. Mm-hmm. Oh, wicked, man. Wicked, wicked. So once you're there playing for, playing for England as a youth, and obviously still currently at Palace, was you then looking to kick on and probably push into the Palace first team? What was it then? Was it, was it like, let me settle myself into the, probably the under-16s and then the 20, 21s? 
yeah. So at halfway through the under 15s, I got offered a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I knew about what scholarships were. Well, that's obviously a year and a half or two years early. It might have even been earlier than that, to be fair. So then I've, I've been offered this scholar, wasn't expecting it again. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of start to realise, all right, the club might have a plan for me. Because, yeah. um, you know, like one of the first kids in the age group to be offered it. Oh, this is a contract. Like, mm -hmm. So then what comes after this? It's a professional contract. Yeah, so then you start thinking about that. And I remember there was, cool, you do well in your scholar, you can get a pro, pro. early type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So then you start to realise, okay, this is, like I say before, it was just for the love. And it still remained to be just for the love. love. But you realise that it's actually something that people put money into, into and you get it so, so it gets um, a bit more serious yeah i forgot your question now uh, what's it like so obviously you've gotten your scholar now yeah once you've gotten your scholar from there is it like okay cool i want to push on and get my professional contract now or is it like uh let me just keep playing my football do what i'm doing and whatever comes of it comes of it but i, I know where i want to get to now yeah it was it was very much so after getting the scholar there's still a period of time before i actually became <clears throat> <clears throat> full time and a scholar mm -hmm. so it's still very much school I was traveling up every day in the mornings mm -hmm. traveling back to school mm -hmm. traveling up in the evenings traveling mm -hmm. back there was a lot of a lot of back and forth between here and palace okay they um, go on continue go on. Yeah, I was gonna say they they took everybody out of school yeah and put them all in one school up in Shirley Park Croydon mm -hmm. and my dad weren't having it because the school the yeah. school weren't the, the best yeah, school yeah, yeah yeah and obviously I was at Bridge Academy at the time mm -hmm. And I just kind of really just started there actually because I've been in other schools my whole life. Mm -hmm. So I'm at Bridge Academy and um, he's like, no, you're not, you're not leaving here where there's at least a decent education mm -hmm. there for you. Um, so I was literally traveling back and forth, waking up. I think my train was at 6.55, 6.53 every morning up to Crystal Palace on that overground. Mm -hmm. And then um, back to school. Straight after school, I'm going back. So I'm packing spaghetti and plant plantain as a daily meal yeah pasta and planting maybe a little pasta bake every day so all these this this like regimented schedule has been in me from before that oh, yeah. but then that as well when it became on me to make sure that i done it um so yeah i'm still concentrating at school at that time and then doing that realizing that this this is something that i can i can do and then obviously we get into like you said scholarship <clears throat> after oh, sorry no even under 16s i start playing up yeah on the 16s, I start playing up for the for the 18s. I think 15s, I started playing up for the 16s. 16s, I started playing up for the 18s. And then you're realising that, ah, cool, you get me yeah, like... Yeah, it's getting serious yeah, now. It's yeah. getting serious now. So, um, after all of that, scoring a couple goals, playing up and that, then you get to the scholarship and that, and then it's like, yeah, it's, it's goal time, it's full time then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Cool, bro. So obviously now we go to that part where you're about to leave school, scholarship plan coming up. Obviously, being in the ends, me in that, like, how did you navigate through having to like deal with friends? Obviously, meeting women, mm. keep on the right path to trying to avoid getting into certain things. Like, what was that kind of thing like? How did you navigate that? I'll just have to put that down to my parents, man. Honestly, as you know, I grew up in the hood, <laughs> but I was so in the bubble, I was so new yeah. from the hood and stuff that was going on around me. <clears throat> I was privately educated up until year nine, yeah. so every day would be a question of getting driven to school, Tower Hamlets first, primary, and then Essex secondary school. So there was no time for me to be in the hood, apart from playing football when I was in Hackney and Crown Manor. That's where I met, you know, real people. Apart from that, it was just, you know, a different, different lifestyle. A lot of, um, obviously, there's nothing wrong with it, but kids with a silver spoon and like everything was kind of given to them there was more middle class whereas we was working class and you could you could see that mm. especially as you grew up you started to realize, realize it, it more mm. yeah, yeah, and then like moving from that to bridge i'll say you got like you got hood wise and then you got otherwise and you can be like you can be educated in both in it so it was good that i had both sides <coughs> yeah so moving to bridge you realize okay this is more what life is really like and I, I just hand it to my parents, man. We always, we always had everything that we needed. We, um, you realise different struggles. Like I realised different struggles when I moved to Bridge with, you know, you know, it's just different. So I, I hand it all to my parents. They kept me out of what was happening right where I was being raised. 
and I just had full focus on education and ball. And um, so by the time it got to the stage where I started being out by myself, making my own way to training, making my own way to matches, blah, 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 I never had that problem because that was already instilled in me. Okay, so it's good still. That's what I like to hear as well. It's like having good parents that can keep you away from certain things, whereas obviously certain people come from single parent homes and they're a lot easier led into other things. Yeah, I can say that for myself kind of thing as well. Mm-hmm. So it's good to always hear that kind of side of the story. There's but a different type of hunger though from single parent homes as well. Yeah, bro. Yeah, okay. Even even just lower, you know, lower net or income backgrounds, like there's a different type of hunger that you cannot recreate nowhere. That's why you see this South London hunger some of the time. True. That's yeah, why you see kids story. coming from South Hun- London, <coughs> Palace. Palace, really? Palace, Millwall, etc., yeah. etc. Charlton. Charlton, how can yeah. I not mention them? Charlton, yeah. Like, it's different to a Cobham kid or a, a West Ham kid. Like, they, they have things that obviously you can't get from being from the hood mm-hmm. that are also good, good but, but the hood has the this coin, hunger yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. and if you get past staying away from things then that hunger can really you know, be seen it as, it, seen it players, yeah. Yeah. but yeah again saying that as well so moving on to obviously you're, you getting your scholar now and obviously playing for the 16s and the 18s talk to me about that as well yes um, the 18s first year I, I wanted to just play 21s and we had a guy called Des Bolping come in he, he was um, an older an older guy and I, I never had no problems with him mm. he was the 18s coach in that first season and um, I just wanted to be playing for the 21s because I'd done the 18s a year before playing out from the 16s so I'm like do I have to do this again mm. I felt like all my England teammates was already playing 21s yeah, yeah, yeah. was not the case yeah. I don't know what made me feel like that <clears throat> but I just wanted to be playing 21s and um, I remember I was, I, was, I was almost pulling my hair out just because I was because I was a scholar playing for the scholars and for the first time in a couple of years I hadn't been playing up. I was training with the 21s every now and then, blah, 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 but I wasn't playing for them, which was just a bit impatient on my part. Get through that season and then obviously in the second year being a scholar, then I'm just fully with the 21s. Everything's running smoothly. Throughout, I'm playing for England internationals. Must be at the under 17 season now. We were, we won the Euros. Out in Malta. Very big thing at the time as well. You felt at the time like the whole world was watching yeah, yeah. Like the under-17s, which now I look back, I realise that is not the case because I don't watch the under-17s. <laughs> no, but I mean, in regards to like, obviously people that follow youth football and aspiring footballers and like, everyone was like, oh yeah, those are the guys, mm. them, and them and the guys, like they're obviously showing up for us. So. Yeah, no, our age group, we was mm. the first to win anything for a while. Our age group, 97s, then went on one, the under 20s World Cup as well. Mm-hmm. Since then, there's obviously been a lot of, I think, like I said, this is all around the time where St George's is just coming to fruition. So obviously things were changing for England youth international mm. setups and the way they've just patterned their whole thing since then is amazing because now we've got the best youth players in the world. I hear that. So again, as well, I wanted to ask you, like at that time as well, was there any like experienced pros you looked up to? like? At the time, maybe at Palace or even for obviously Arsenal or whatever. Any man that you look up to him, be like, yeah, I want to emulate my game on him. Like. Yeah, obviously being a right back, Nathaniel Klein. Mm. Nathaniel Klein was a man I looked up to because I'd seen him grow up as a young kid at Palace, and he was young himself. He, he was completely the blueprint. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I think in that England's and England setup, like as in the first team men's, there was Glenn Johnson who kind of changed things for right backs mm. in terms of being becoming attacking players. Yeah, yeah. Then just after him, it was, it was Klein, isn't it? Mm, yeah, and yeah. him coming from Palace is like <clears throat> always, this is possible. This is really possible. So him, obviously in a different position, Victor Moses just coming through Palace, mm. going on to do big things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You realise that this is put Sean Scannell. Mm, Sean, Sean, Sean Scannell, Scannell yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and then obviously away from the club and a bit closer in me to age, there was always like, um, I remember I met Chooks when I was a young kid and he was the, the Chooks and Iki. Okay, yeah when he was um, a young kid and I was coming up at Palace and he was the, like, the king of Arsenal. Mm-hmm. And um, that's funny, we played together, it's mad funny, I think. I've told him this as well, because his auntie, or his godmom, his auntie, their kids went to my school. 
Oh, so we came across each other, but mm. then he would never have known this now. Mm -hmm. And then there was Chuba Akfom, obviously, just a couple years older than him, but he was always, obviously... He was the name as well. He was the name, was the name yeah. Then obviously the people that he played with, Izzy Brown, mm. Dom Solanke, that's why I got a bit of a thing for Chelsea, to be honest, just because a lot of my friends at the time were... were from Chelsea, yeah. yeah. So, um, those are the people, really. Kleine, Victor Moses, and then people closer to my age as well. Sick, man. Sick. So, look, all of you guys have had careers now. It's like, yeah, man. It's great to see me. It is, it is. Uh, even, even people in the youth setups at Palace, Reese Alassani, Ryan mm, Innes, mm. who I play with again now, those were the guys right above me that was like playing for England. And I was like, this is possible, man. Like, I remember Reese Alassani as well, because I always remember him because of his hair. And mm, that. Mm. I remember still. Big player, big baller. So did you ever come across as well, Wilf, Wilf the Half? Um, not in his first stint at the club as much. Definitely not in his first stint at the club, but when he then went to United and then came back, that's when we trained, we trained together, in it? So that's when I'm in and around the first team at Palace. And he's mm. come back and we're training together and obviously it was away trips and, and um, yeah, yeah. So obviously I've trained with him a few times. Mm. Is that in Miami with him once? <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> oh, different story still. <laughs> But um, yeah, that's wicked. Still, um, so obviously, this is the, this is the, this is the, this is the funny part. Well. Not even a funny part. This is the, I think that a lot of people don't know. But what's coming now? No, nah, I'm not even mad. <laughs> it's um, moving on from Palace, yeah. Mm. A lot of people don't know, but you was originally one of the first Englishmen to go abroad to Germany. Like a lot of people don't know, everyone thinks it's oh, Sancho was the blueprint to go for any famous players to go to Germany and ball out. But he's the blueprint. He's the blueprint for to, the, to, to blow up. Yeah, but yeah, you yeah. were originally the first person to really say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and take my talents elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, and I think I might actually, have been one of the first where it weren't forced upon me. Mm, no, you, yeah. Because yeah. I, like, I was offered a pro at Palace and turn it down as opposed to not being have not having nothing in the country and then having to go out abroad. So in terms of like being I guess like kind of hot at the time playing for the England youth setups, having come off the back of that Euros win, I'm like I, I want to try something different, and that um, was initially I come from not wanting to, you know, be loaned out or maybe just fall by the wayside and wanting to go to Europe where I knew that young players went academy into the first team, so it was yeah, a yeah. smooth transition mm -hmm. as opposed to academy and then there's this gap like what do we do here? Is there a plan? So I, I wanted to go out into, I wanted to go Holland on loan. I said, I wanted to go Holland on loan. Papa, how can we make it happen? Mm -hmm. So Papa starts looking and we're talking about, obviously now it's just who knows who type of thing. Papa, along with my agent, um, EPG at the time, Emeko Bassi, they're like, how can we make this happen? And they linked up with um, another agent who was German. And he said, listen, we've got, um, we've got this and this and this for you. There's a few clubs involved, but when you have blood back after you it was pretty quickly a decision was like you don't really need to keep looking yeah 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 so um so i went over to gladbach and i um, had a few you know had a few conversations had a look at everything out there and it, there was no comparison to palace at the time well, if we're being honest like, yeah, yeah. champions league club academy already got this thing going palace was a top academy don't get me wrong they brought up through a lot of players based on the catchment area, but that was for the champ. Mm -hmm. Remember, Palace at the time had just moved into the Prem and yeah. staying up was the aim, yeah, yeah, you get yeah. me? So it's not even a knock at Palace, that wasn't their thing, wasn't let's bring through young players. It was just let's stay up. So I didn't, you know. Especially with the ownership troubles at the time as well, moving on from the, new, from the old on the Simon George and into yeah. the administration area. Yeah, like I, remember, I remember all of that quite vividly, but I was a bit younger than that at the time. At that time, um, I think it's CPFC 2010, they might have called themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Parish and the rest, they had stabled the club, stabilised the club. Like I said, we had this um, this um, run in the champ, Ian Holloway as the gaffer, he then got us promoted. Mm -hmm. Ian Holloway, yeah. top gaffer, yeah. by the way. What a funny guy, but good. character. But even as the way he wanted to play, because I would train a lot at the time with him. And it was he was he based it all on Barcelona. Fair yeah, bro. I never thought that, you know. Bro, based it all on Barcelona. He didn't want passes to be more than... 30 yards, like come close and get on the ball and, so and just done. keep it ticking. It was amazing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And um, that promotion around, and then it was obviously like, cool, we're in the Prem, and they managed to keep us there. Like, like Steve Parrish and the rest, full, fair play to them. They've stabilized yeah, the proper, club, yeah. made the club a stable mm. Prem club. Mm. Um, yeah, they weren't happy with me leaving, obviously. Of course. Yeah, um, we had some 
you know, exchanges between myself, my dad and Steve Parrish. And they weren't happy with me leaving and they made that quite clear. And I understand that. But I, I just, you know, I just wanted to try something new. I think they thought that there was other external exterior motives. There wasn't. And you can't blame them for thinking that they had this, the John Bostock situation before. Mm, mm, mm. And, you know, that wasn't the case for me. So um, hopefully they see that now, that that wasn't what was going on. But um, at the time, they, they weren't happy with it. Okay. So, yeah, talk to me about, about, about obviously arriving at Glad's back now and signing your deal. Mm. What was your... What was the path you thought, well, they said it would be laid out to you and obviously how did it go out there for you? One thing I can't knock about it was just the experience. Like you said, I was one of the first people to do it. I didn't have no one to look at and say, this is what goes on, this is how it goes. I, I went out there, I was like a... I was the... What's the word I'm looking for? I was like... I was like you, you, you say you acted like a sponge, so you took it in for yeah, you to I, learn. I had to. You wanted had to. that to be in out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So I went out there, I learned the culture, I learned the language, I, I immersed myself in it. Um, and that's the best thing I could have done. So I, if it didn't go well on the pitch, I knew that I would have a whole new experience. Mm. And on the pitch, things were, things were difficult. It was a, like I say, it was a whole new environment. It's a whole new way of football. Mm. It's probably the closest to England tactically, but um, but like, there's it's a whole different pace to it. The way that they train is different because the way that the games go is different. Um, I think England's probably better suited to my attributes. But I, I done well out there. I played. I played for Gladbach's under 23s for a good few years. When I first went out there, I got injured in my first week of training. This is with mm. the first team. Yeah. Just before the first friendly game, and that set me back a few months. Months or something yeah, like that. It set me back about two and a half, three months at the time. Mm. So by the time I came back, it was November, and I, I was back. I was with the twenty threes, and then um, ended up just having to jug it out for years with the twenty threes, man. So talk to me then. How was that for you mentally? How did that affect your mental health? Um, it was tough, man. It, it it was tough, but I go back to also being a scholar at Palace, where I think those times build you up for tough times. I mm. think that scholarship period, I don't know what it's like now for kids, but I know at Palace, specifically at the time, that was character building. You had early mornings, you had going out in colder than this weather to go and set up the pitches, watch players. Mm. We, we didn't have we didn't have a sink with running hot water to so watch the players. Nah, bro, we washed it. Like, in the mornings, if you hadn't washed it the night before, which was cold anyway, then in the mornings, you're breaking the ice in the sink to use the water to wash players' boots. I feel they should bring that back still, I can't lie. I'm an advocate for it. They man. should bring that back, bro. 100 percent It just it builds this character, it builds, builds this build toughness. And it's humbling as well, it's especially when you've got man on big wages that ain't yeah. you know what I'm saying. Like we should be we haven't done nothing in the game yet. We should be You're doing them things, yeah. Exactly. Learning your trade like yeah, man. 100 percent Ben Garner would have us out um moving the goals at whatever clock in the morning, they're frosty, you know, we're moving them across pitches, we're setting up the cones, it's kind of, I think we've lost that in the game at the minute. 100% I agree. I, I think we should bring it back personally. Mm, I totally agree, bro. So yeah, hey, saying that as well, from, from glad back, obviously you made, you made a made profession, you made your profession debut there. Yeah? Mm-hmm. After, after two years jugging it out, mm-hmm. um, a couple of gaffers sacked in the first team, then there was uh, Dieter Hecking came in, his name is Dieter Hecking, an old school kind of guy, but not too old school. Um, and then they also, what was the game changer for me was they brought in a guy called Otto Adol, who was given the job of being the transition coach between the 23 or the academy and the first team. Mm-hmm. So I remember him coming, he's a black man, a Ghanaian man, and I thought, when I seen that, I thought, hmm, okay, mm. let's see. And then, um, he done what he needed to do, I'll be honest, bro. Like, he really done what he needed to do. And there's a credit to myself as well, obviously. He wouldn't just put, put you through, man through for no reason. Yeah, of course. But then, um, yeah, he, yeah. he started watching the 21s, 23s games, and he's like, obviously, we play in the fourth division of German football. Mm-hmm. So you're playing man, men's games the whole time. Which is a good thing for development, I yeah, can't lie. 100%. Yeah. At least you could say you've got all these professional games to your name, even yeah. if it's not where you want to be. Mm. And he's seeing them games, and he's saying, so why are you not... Here and I'm like, bro, I'm trying, man. Like, I'm the same thing I'm doing here. What you're seeing is what I've been doing for the past two years. Like, nothing's changed. And then there was an international break, so most of the players, the first team player, well, a few of the first team players were on the internationals, and we didn't have a solid right back at the time. Anyway, it was kind of centre backs playing right back, 
and then they put me in for a friendly game because as opposed to having two weeks off in internationals the German teams have a friendly game and maybe five days off so they put me in for a friendly game and it was my first involvement with the first team for like a year and a half wow. and um, I scored one assisted one hit the post and then all of a sudden it's like oh where's man you been I'm like bro I've been here yeah. I've literally been here and I, I think it's just probably took me a bit longer than maybe everybody expected I'd kind of fallen by the wayside and but then yeah Otto said listen you need to be trained I started training with the first team regularly after that mm -hmm. and in that next kind of period is what leading up to like my, my Bundesliga debut now. Mm -hmm. It was a time in my life where it was getting through it was tough times, man. Obviously, seeing Thierry out there as well, I remember he was a childhood hero, wasn't it, being an Arsenal fan? Like, yeah, man. You got to play in front of him as well. What was that like as well? There's a stigma around footballers, so I'm just trying to be as well-rounded and individual as possible. <laughs>